And uh, that was a great presentation, Kim, wherever you have gone to, thank you. Um, it certainly does some of the work for introducing my more local scale uh, view of climate change, what we've observed, some of the impacts that that has had or effects that that has had. One of the things that um, the NSF tells us, the National Science Foundation tells us, don't use the word impacts, use the word effects, because impact is when something smashes into something else um, when you're doing public communication. So we're trying to, uh, trying to, to uh, rephrase our, our speaking a little bit and, and reduce the jargon there. But we're looking at the effects that that has had on the Grand Traverse Bay region. And then also, what might we look forward and see with uh, a variety of different types of models and then also taking some of the steps in terms of trying to quantify or calculate how effective different adaptation or mitigation strategies might be. So this is work that we conducted um, starting in around 2012, I think, through 2015. Um, and it was funded by the Sea Grant. They have an integrated assessment program. Um, so speaking of Sea Grant, Sea Grant's budget, they're part of NOAA. Um, the, the administration budget actually zeroed out Sea Grant entirely, the whole program. Um, thankfully, Congress, um, Sea Grant is, is a, 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 an agency with many defenders uh, spread all across Congress, and so they were able to restore Sea Grant's funding. Um, but it's certainly, they perform um, really vital funding and, and work directly, data product provision, things like that. One of the things they do in Michigan is they fund a couple of integrative assessment programs every couple of years, and ours was focused on the Grand Traverse Bay region. Now, what, a, what an integrative assessment means in their view is it's working together with stakeholders to, um, so that's the integrative piece, to assess, um, in this case, what might the vulnerability be of the region, the Grand Traverse Bay region, and then what might some of the mitigation strategies uh, be that we could use. So the approach that we took here is to quantify changes in temp, uh, precip, um, ice cover, lake level, stream flow, and water quality. Um, and we certainly, we made a lot of headway in each of those, not as much in water quality, largely because the amount of monitoring of water quality, at least long-term regular monitoring, is much lower. Um, the state does some of that, um, but really not enough to get a, a, a small-scale sort of regional perspective quite as much. And we wanted to assess some of the impacts of these changes on things like algal, bloom, algal blooms in, in um, Grand Traverse Bay, invasive wetland plants, shorelines, nutrient sediments, and pathogens. I mean, these are the things that the movement of water really affects, and that was one of the big o overarching goals. Um, I definitely think, you know, in the, the course of this, these are still active research areas for our program. So we didn't get all the way there, but instead we focused on the physical effects of the work that we're doing. Um, in terms of how climate change is affecting the movement and availability of water, as well as how direct and indirect temperature effects are impacting uh, local recreational um, and, and other resources. And so um, then we work to develop and assess adaptive management strategies um, based on stakeholder recommendations and concerns. And this little picture here just shows you the region that we're focused on. So um, we've defined this based on a collection of different um, hydrologic unit code or HUC uh, codes, uh, code watersheds that um, encompass the Grand Traverse Bay and also its sort of surrounding coastal communities. Okay, I just want to briefly introduce our technical team. Um, and then a number of us on the top row are from MSU. Um, in my uh, immediate lab, my MSU hydrogeology lab, we have Dave Heinemann, Sherry Martin, and myself. Um, and then we also have Pat Norris, she's an economist, as well as Erin Dreeland, a uh, fisheries and, and wildlife natural resources person. Um, we're working with people uh, like Christine Christman, who is working at um, the Watershed Center in Traverse City, Mark Riederlin from uh, NOAA Sea Grant, and then a couple more professors from MSU. And of course, if you're familiar with, ac with academic work, the students really do most of the work, um, and we just present it. So uh, a number of the, the uh, a lot of the graphics here were produced directly by, by students and their work. So I wanted to just talk for a moment about our risk model. And, and the reason that I want to talk about this is just to give you an idea of the, the language that we're looking at. So um, in, in this model, we have first a hazard. Okay, so what is actually causing us to potentially uh, be vulnerable and have a risk? And in that case, we're looking at climate change drivers. It's something really we don't have the ability to affect in this region. Obviously, we all have the ability to do something as individuals and as our, with our vote and, and with our product choices to influence 
the broader global climate change phenomenon. But um, in this case, what we're viewing that as is an external driver. That hazard then affects us via an exposure. Okay, so th things like direct physical responses. Okay, what does the direct warming of the air do to our landscape? What does the direct increase in, in precipitation do to our landscape? And then how humans are influenced or otherwise influence those response, responses. So our agriculture creates a risk for us because that agriculture is something that we depend on and then we, that directly interacts with both temperature and precipitation changes. And then through our water resource use, we have a vulnerability, okay? Um, if we, uh, in this case, we're, because we're focusing on water, if we need stream flow or we need groundwater resources to irrigate our, our crops and so forth. So this hazard times an exposure and a vulnerability leads to risk. And I also want to talk about mitigation and adaptation separately. Um, the words are often mixed. And when we're talking about mitigation, the, the word actually has almost been dropped from the literature in terms of climate change because it has been used really, how do we mitigate climate change? And um, I think there's a, uh, perhaps a, a, bit of a, mm, a bit of a reluctant belief that we're not really going to be talking too much about mitigating climate change anytime soon, um, that we're instead focusing on adaptation to this thing that's happening. Um, hopefully uh, a little bit of optimism in terms of sort of global climate change mitigation can resume, but we have actually mitigation options at the local scale. Okay, when we take an, an action to, um, to, for instance, if, if we have uh, climate change is leading to an increase in stream flow, and that increase in stream flow um, leads to more, say, stormwater events that contaminate our beaches, we can actually mitigate that change by, by altering things like stormwater retention. Okay, so that's a mitigation action, as opposed to adapting to a change, which would be like closing the beach more often. Okay, so those, those two go hand in hand. Okay, so we had a bunch of uh, questions from our stakeholders, and I'm just gonna throw these up here. We held a couple of different workshops starting in 2012, and a lot of the questions were, um, as we expected, were not water questions, um, but had, a, in, had either a direct or indirect connection to water. And really, um, economic impacts um, and social impacts are the top questions that stakeholders had in this. Um, and specifically wondering what, what are the changes that would be predicted, how would extreme events in stormwater change. This, the focus, especially in this region, um, you, you might not re realize it, but the folks in the Grand Traverse region, um, especially the stakeholders there, are enormously engaged in terms of stakeholders in a region. And there was a certain, uh, there's a certain amount of sort of stakeholder engagement fatigue that goes on. So really what we got was not as broad of a view of things as what we just got the people who were really, really active. And that happened to be the stormwater people um, working in, in Traverse City. That wasn't just, but that was really a focus um, for, for good reason that those people have been very successful in, in making changes. And so that's energizing the community there. Um, how, do we do, how do we support native species? So an ecological concern. Um, that certainly has impacts um, uh, relative or is directly impacted by climate change. And then how do we prevent invasion of new species, both things in like wetlands and inland lakes and questions like that. Um, how much do we need to do and, and when do we stop is, is certainly a relevant question. Um, so these were all a number of questions that, that we had to then subset out and identify from that a series that were much more directly related to water and, and, and its uh, associated effects things like extreme effects, and extreme events, and things like that. The next step we took once we started working with the stakeholders, was we wanted to come back to them with an assessment of, at the local scale, what has actually happened since we tried to go back to 1900 um, in terms of climate and stream flow and things like that. And what we found, uh, just summarizing here, and I'll show you some slides, is that temperatures have warmed, okay? That's um, just like we saw in, in Kim's talk. Temperatures have worn, warmed on the, on the order of a degree, a, a degree and a half over the last 50 years, and about um, 1.8 to 2 degrees over the last century, uh, uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Precipitation has increased, both total precipitation and snowfall, and I'll show you that. And the number of reported storm events has increased, and there's some indication of increasing extreme events. As Kim mentioned, um, depending on how you define those, you know, number of, uh, number of days with greater than 1.25 inches of, of rainfall, um, but the, the records on that are a little bit more spotty, it's, and some of the extreme events happen at, at the sort of sub-daily level, um, so there's not as good of records over that time period, but we certainly, the research suggests that those are likely to increase in the future. 
So if we look at these spatially, um, just as sort of points on a, on a map, and, instead of trying to connect them, because what we find is that individual cities and individual location records have pretty different trends. Um, but in general, oh, you can't see this very well. This is slightly warmer here. So we have cooler to no trend. And there's a couple stations, especially um, surrounding and in, in, in uh, direct proximity to water, that have had very little temperature trend over the last, um, I think, what is the record on this? I believe this is 1940, 41, actually. Maybe it goes a little bit back. Uh, it's about 100 years back. That's, that's it. Um, each station had a slightly different record. But the stations um, in and around the Grand Traverse Bay have seen very little temperature change, um, in, in large part due to the effect of the lake and changes in ice cover on the lake and, um, and things like that. Whereas more inland areas and higher areas, East Jordan, Boyne Falls, Gaylord, have seen um, greater, uh, degree, greater increases. These are in degrees per year. So over 100 years, what you see is some of these stations have seen three degrees of warming at those locations, but then some have seen very little. So even, you know, we had that broad Great Lakes view, even down at this much more local view, the temperature trends at these stations can vary pretty tremendously. And that, that variability actually uh, leads to Oh, I have it for precipitation. That variability leads to different perceptions in terms of how climate change might actually be affecting people locally. So if we look at precipitation, this is a, a time series view. Um, this is a particular station. Oh, I'm, I apologize. I don't have the particular station written on here. But this is an example of what the kind of analysis that we did for, for each station in the region. We, we took its annual temperature or annual precipitation or temperature. And then we fit a, a curve through that and then plotted it over space. So this particular station here shows um, that over the 100 year record, um, we've had an increase of about three to or three or so inches, three and a half inches over that record. And now if we map that over the 20, 20 years, 23 stations that have at least 50 years of record, um, in general, there's a slight increasing trend in precipitation. Um, some of these stations are slightly drier, um, and it depends a little bit on when they started because there are some pretty big swings in terms of the overall precipitation record. Um, particularly once you get back to about 1930. But most of the stations are either slightly wetter to much, to much wetter. Um, and in general, the northern stations have a little bit more of a precipitation increase when we're looking back many decades. But when we look back just a few years, um, over the last decade, people tend to recall those changes much more um, clearly than they do the changes further back. And you can think about this yourself when you're trying to, to think about what, especially if you've lived in this area for a long time, you tend to think back to your childhood, what things were like. Well, what I remember from being a child is I remember the really hot days and the really snowy days, and it seems like there were a ton of them. But in reality, there were probably just a few, but they, they just stick in my mind much more clearly. But we can actually remember pretty accurately how things have been trending over the last few years. And we look over just the, pr the prior decade, so ending in 2014 um, in this case, what we see is there has been a significant increasing trend. Um, and that definitely does impact people's um, recollection and their perceptions. Another part of this that I'm not um, reporting on here is we did a, a survey over the region of people's perceptions in climate change. How has climate been changing? Um, along with other aspects related to climate change to try and better understand how spatially they, they might perceive their climate differently and then how that actually relates to the physical record. Um, and, and Pretty, it's pretty interesting results. It's still, uh, that's still a work in progress in terms of um, publishing that. Um, but one of the things that has been persistent across the region, and Kim mentioned as well, is there's been an increase in snowfall. And this has largely been in years in which there's little snow, a little ice cover on the lakes, or, or less ice cover on the lakes. Um, so in general, there's been a pretty strong increase in annual snowfall. Again, this is just one example, example station. But that's much more consistent across the period. Um, and, and stronger in the, in the uh, lake effect precipitation band. If we look now at stream flow, so all of those direct changes in temperature and precip have a, a series of related and following impacts on the landscape, both it impacts in terms of how water moves and evaporates, as well as changes in, in terms of the, the ecology and biology on the landscapes. Um, if we take the Boardman River stream flow, so this is, uh, the Boardman River actually shifted the, the gauge that's available um, so if we go back to the, the 1998, which is the start of the current location on the, the upper Boardman, um, and we look at the seasonal stream flow. So plotted in red, um, yeah, red is spring, 
blue is fall, black is summer, and green is winter, what we can see is the patterns themselves in those seasons are changing. So spring, even over the last 20 years, spring stream flow has been increasing, fall has been increasing, while winter and summer flows have been decreasing. And this change in seasonal, uh, in the seasonal pattern, and these are defined as like uh, January, um, j uh, January, February, March is winter and so on. So in those three month periods. So um, what we did was we analyzed each of the stream flow stations and looked at those shifts um, because those shifts are related to changes in how much snow is available um, and how much, how early that snowpack melts is, is one of the primary changes. But then when you get to summertime, the, the length of the growing season, the temperatures and the evaporation potential um, during this, the, the growing season certainly impact that as well. So these two um, plots here, the spring and summer tell much of this story. So up here, spring means in general, um, it, because it starts by this definition in April, that's when you start to see most of the melt of your seasonal snowpack. And so what we've been seeing is that our, springs, the, our spring flows have been increasing significantly. Okay, um, while well, our summer flows are decreasing significantly. So this pattern, the trade-off of um, increasing spring flows due to things like earlier snow melt um, lead to, in part, to decreasing summer, uh, summer stream flows across the entire region. When we look at fall and winter slopes, those changes are more variable. They do have a consistent pattern where we have increasing flows in the north in the fall and decreasing flows in the south. Um, that are related to a series of complex factors. And then winter changes are, are much more variable and, and depend much more on the starting period of that particular gauge. So one of the things that we recognize very clearly in this project is that in order to do this sort of local scale climate assessment, we really needed, um, we, we needed more data. There, there weren't a lot of data. We started the, there wasn't a lot of data that really went back to a long enough period for us to identify trends. So um, we started out, we wanted to identify things like, well, how have, you know, how have uh, spring bloom <coughs> dates changed? How have, uh, you know, the arrival of certain birds and things like that? And the more we dug, the, the more frustrated we became with the lack of, of available monitoring data. And I, I just want to mention this, that this is something we've realized for a while, um, that there's almost no long-term groundwater mo monitoring going on in the state of Michigan. In some areas with regional, large, important aquifers, like the High Plains area, the Ogallala Aquifer, they do have long-term groundwater monitoring. Here in Michigan, the USG USGS maintains like a, a handful, maybe 10 gauges um, over any length of time, and most of those are clustered around a couple of cities. And so um, starting back in 2003, we started, we instrumented a number of wells around the Grand Traverse region using a series of wells that the USGS dug in the 1970s and were interested in filling in. And we said, well, w how about you just leave those open and we'll, we'll maintain them and we'll monitor groundwater levels. So we did that. We installed in 17 locations. There's actually 18 dots because one of them is a stream flow gauge at Ranch Rudolph. Um, we've been monitoring water levels and temperatures in the groundwater since 2003. And starting in 2008 and continuing more in 2010, we began measuring soil moisture and soil temperature because that's another variable, particularly in natural environments that we have very little measuring of. And we became really interested in it because as the change, as uh, climate change leads to alteration of the snowpack, the seasonal snowpack, um, we expect that there should be pretty big changes in terms of soil moisture availability and soil freezing and soil temperatures underneath, which all have impacts on agriculture. Um, as was mentioned, so say the, the growing season gets earlier by 15 days. Well, if the soil doesn't warm, that, ha that doesn't mean that you can necessarily go out and plant your seeds earlier. Um, I, I thought I'd get a jump on the grass growing season this year by planting while well, it was relatively cool, but we still had warm days. But my grass seeds took three weeks to germinate because the soil was still so cool from the, the preceding um, late winter that we had. Um, so we're, we really don't have enough data to, to understand this, and we've been working to try and, and, and continue to monitor this. So we used some of the funds, just a little bit from this integrated assessment to keep this network running, and we sort of pieced it together um, with a lot of volunteer effort uh, over the last uh, number of years. And one of the things that we can look at with it, um, this graph is a little bit, uh, it's kind of interesting to think about, but there's two colors on here. There's a forest and an open. These are at the same site. They're separated by, oh, about 100 feet. One is in a dense red pine plantation, you know, those row, the row plantations. And then the other is in a mowed open area. And um, plotted on here, so in 
On this side, we have in squares, this is the 90th percentile. So what are the highest temperatures that are observed in, in, on average over each year? And this is the 10th percentile. What are the lowest temperatures? So I wanted to show you that um, there are impacts not just in terms of climate, but also in terms of the land cover. Um, uh, in terms of annual or in terms of temperatures and this is depth so if we look at the surface it's it's zero and down to two meters here in, in depth so at this particular site and it's pretty common elsewhere what we see is if you have a forest your warmer temperatures are lower than they are in the open which makes a lot of sense in the summertime but they're also they're also um, or they're cooler in the summertime they're warmer in the winter time so the variability in the forest is significantly less than the variability in the open area but on average the forest soils are cooler Okay. So this type of, of um, variability is, is influenced by human, uh, by human behavior, human land cover choices. And I'll bring this up later again when we're talking about how might we actually adapt to um, climate change and mitigate some of its impacts. Is that we do have a choice of land cover, and that land cover can affect uh, soil temperature, which certainly could be important for helping us to reduce the impacts of, of warming on, uh, on cold water fisheries, for instance. It also helps us when we're talking about um, the amount of groundwater recharge that comes off or the amount of runoff that comes off. We can make choices about our landscape in terms of trying to better manage those really large scale um, drivers. So here's a couple of uh, three of our wells and I wanted to show these. We do have some data gaps. Um, we've done our best to keep this uh, continuous record as much as we can. Um, there, are three, yeah, there are three wells that are shown here that are just highlighted. Um, they're hard to read individually on the screen. But they're from the central area. They're, they're all kind of relatively upland, not really near the lake. And what you see is around staying uh, through 2004 <laughs> to around 2011, these wells were relatively low. And they've been rising since. And actually what they look a lot like, um, if you were to add on the recent record, they look a lot like the, the lake levels. Okay? Um, not that they're necessarily responding to lake levels, but that the drivers of lake level changes are also impacting the, the, the level of groundwater in this region, in these otherwise natural areas. I will note that the increase in groundwater levels is not just here. It's in many places around uh, Lake Michigan, or around the state of Michigan, in particular in the snowy area, the snowband area. And that increases flood risk. If you have higher groundwater levels, you have less room for that water to go. If you are in a, a place where nuisance flooding is at all an issue, which it is in my backyard, you'll know that it's happening more and more frequently. Um, that that I, we get winter and spring flooding. And that's um, in large part due to the influence of groundwater. So we're hoping to keep that um, network up and running. And we're actually working to get the data online more frequently. Uh, but it's not, it's not set up as a, a telemeter gauge network like the USGS has. We were able to get some pretty cool data on um, agriculture in terms of uh, the effects of temperature in agriculture from the um, uh, Northwest Michigan, um, uh, oh, what's it, MSU Ag Station that's there. They've, they've been monitoring bloom dates for different species of uh, cherry trees and as well as some apricot. And they have about 30-ish years of record um, going back to 1983 on this. And what you see is a lot of variability. This record is, is just a little bit short um, to infer long-term trends in it. But these recent years especially are really very interesting. Because in this, you see this, this year where we had an incredibly early spring. We had seven days that were in the 70s that led to a really early bloom in these tree species. Um, but you see this huge amount of variability in recent years. And it's this variability that is particularly problematic if you're trying to manage these um, to manage these orchards because orchards aren't something that you can choose whether or not you're going to plant each and every year. They're perennial species that often you're investing for two, even three decades um, when you choose to plant. And so managing those in a, in a more variable climate might actually be more problematic than simply just saying whether it's warmer or cooler or wetter. Okay. So those are some of the things that we looked at, and we have more in, this, in the integrated assessment report that's up on Seagrant's website, <coughs> website. The next piece that we're gonna do relies on global climate models. And um, I don't know if, how much you've heard or, or know about um, global climate models. They're, they're sometimes called general circulation models. Uh, same, same acronym, two different names. They have evolved in complexity and scope tremendously since they first began to be used. Um, really in the 1980s is when the first, what we would consider a modern general circulation model or global climate model got used. Um, <coughs> there we started looking at both the land and the sea 
Um, then we added the, uh, we, the, the global scientific community, I'm just a user really, started adding in things like aerosols and then going in from sulfate aerosols, which um, are really important and is the result of industrial activity, into actually directly trying to simulate how carbon um, and diesel emissions affect uh, the climate to directly simulating how climate in influences plants. Adding all these complex layers to these models and along the way the models have been getting better and better when we look at their ability to reconstruct past climate. Okay, so the, the scientists, thousands and thousands of scientists are building better and better models every year. And as a result, what they do, the climate community has a series of um, what they call moderate model intercomparison projects that they bring all of these different global communities or global uh, research labs together and compare all their models for the purpose not of crowning a king, but rather of saying, well, which models do really well and where and why and what can we learn from each other to do this all better? And in this particular, um, the, the latest of these intercomparison projects is called CMIP-5. Um, and there, there's about 24 models, depending on which scenario you're, you're using, um, that we brought together the outputs of those models to offer specific uh, regional forecasts for the Grand Traverse region. And these are the models also that are used by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in their um, most recent assessment report for. So these models have been out since uh, 2014 or 2013, and the next CMIP-6 is, is following on its heels, so it should be ready in another year or so. And I don't want to note specifically the numbers because we just saw a really good overview of those numbers. Um, I will actually quickly go through a couple more maps. I just want to mention that the models, there's 24 different models in, in the main scenarios, and they really generally agree on temperatures within a one to two degree band. Precipitation is a much more a much harder quantity to model, and the, the models have a wider range. Okay, and it's really important to understand that when we're talking about precipitation forecasts with our current generation of models, we have some confidence, but not everywhere, and um, and not all all through the year. Some times of the year, there's more confidence than others. So I will use precipitation forecasts, but I want you to take those with some. Not skepticism, but some healthy appreciation that scientists aren't yet fully certain that this is what the future might look like. Because you'll get a different answer depending on which model you use. And that's certainly something that is being actively worked on. This is a, a plot, very similar region. The data were, were extracted just for the Great Lakes Basin rather than the Great Lakes States. And I'm using a different set of forecasts here. I'm using um, the more modern set. They're named RCP 2.6 through 8.5. And what that just means is the 2.6 scenario is one in which we get our act together as a human species and we actually start to go net negative on emissions by the end of the century. So we're actually pulling carbon dioxide out of the air. It's an optimistic scenario um, and one that there was a lot of argument within the scientific community about whether or not it should even be included. But in the end, um, the interest of the what if won out and, and the de decision was made to go ahead with that. Um, to the most, uh, I guess, least optimistic scenario, the 8.5, where emissions increase the most rapidly, which unfortunately looks a lot like what we're currently doing. Our, our current emissions pathway is somewhere between the emissions of RCP6 and 8.5. And this just shows for each of those scenarios how temperatures might change um, across the entire region, across this entire region here. Um, so I'm going to skip through this in the interest of time. This is a precipitation plot just to show you that things are indeed a lot more variable. And this is the average of 24 models. That's that variable year to year. So the actual, if I plotted all of them on there, they're tremendously variable in terms of their annual precipitation. But there are some, in, you know, in general, a couple of the emission scenarios are higher than others. But it depends kind of on how the scenarios are constructed. So um, I do want to point that out. There's probably some increasing trends here, but there's a lot less distinction across the scenarios. Okay, just a note on why we're using models. Well, for one, I mentioned we don't have really great records on how things have looked in the past, unfortunately. Um, at least not everywhere at the sort of local or regional scale that we're hoping to work. But also, um, if we have a model that we're confident in, that has done a good job of predicting past behavior, then we can use it to make predictions moving forward. And that's really what we're very, very much interested in when we're talking about climate change vulnerabilities. 
So from the stakeholder meeting that I mentioned, we identified several questions that were really specifically related to either direct or indirect temperature effects. This was the first step we wanted to take. Remembering that the climate change forecasts are significantly more confident for temperatures, we thought this is a good place to start. So there were questions about changes in freeze thaw. How, how will potholes and the need to repair roads change um, with increasing freeze thaw? How will that affect crop loss? Obviously, it's an important factor when we're talking about um, uh, those uh, are blooming uh, apples and cherries and things like that. And then things that are just directly changed in temperature, people are interested in how fall colors would change. That's a recreational question, not just an aesthetic one, because people come here for that purpose. Um, will the growing season change, or how will it change? And then will heating and cooling costs increase? Um, we, were, we worked really hard on the fall colors, but couldn't come up with a model we were happy with, so I substituted it for how will the ski season change, because I'm interested in that, and actually I think it's a pretty important question for the region. Um, I'll skip past that. Um, just, I wanted the, that slide just showed, this is the methods that we used. We used all of those forecasts from all of those models. We took it over the whole region, and then we averaged it together to one number over, the, over each decade. So this presents to you a decadal sequence of of numbers from each of, of three scenarios. We haven't included that, the 2.6 scenario um, because we don't, didn't consider that a likely, a likely candidate. I'm going to show you a series of slides that all look very similar. We have decades starting in, in the 1980s, so this is at 1985, 1995, and so on, going out to 2095 is the final year. So numbers prior to this line are using observed data. Numbers going forward are using a specific um, climate forecast. So the top shows the change in heating degree days, and what you see is that goes down. There will be less need for heating in this region, which will save energy, save money, uh, potentially lead to different needs in terms of building design and things like that um, for insulation and energy efficiency. Um, the numbers don't go down to zero, so that's not plummeting all the way to nothing in terms of heating, but they do go down significantly. Those, the loss in the heating need, though, is at least partially, if not fully ups, offset in terms of um, when you look at actual energy use by an increasing cooling need. And this is actually something that's really significant for this area because a lot of homes do not have air conditioning. I was out sampling one of our wells one time and 50 feet away was a guy who, was, who had his uh, well on spraying water onto his roof in order to cool his, his mobile home. So, I mean, this is obviously like the worst possible way that you can cool your home <laughs> from a water and energy standpoint, but it was the only thing he had. And so the increase in cooling need is something that has practical impact in terms of new building codes, um, retrofitting old, old uh, homes, um, and making resources available for people who are unable to purchase their own. So that's a, a certainly a direct useful one. Here's the one that's, that's interesting and has an economic impact, and that's changes in the ski season. Um, if you're familiar with skiing in the area, you'll know that they rely, um, in most years, very heavily on artificial snow. Okay. And in general, you can make, um, based on a literature survey that I did, you can get an, a ski several runs open, enough to have the, the, um, the resort open after about a week of days where the average temperature is below 34 degrees. Because, because of the, the physics of it, you can make snow even if the day is slightly warmer than freezing. So what we did is we then plotted this out and showed that the, ble the outlook is rather bleak. In the worst scenario, we have ski season starting um, in January, okay, so after the new year, and then ending by the middle of March. So you don't even get three full months for a resort to have its lifts open, which it certainly calls into question the economics of all but probably the, the, best, um, the best situated ski resorts in the area. And even under the less optimistic scenarios, we see decreases in over a month. So when you're talking about a ski season that's only five, five and a half months long at its longest, and you lose a month of that under any case, you're talking about major impacts in terms of how those, those facilities will operate. Of course, we also have a longer growing season. Here's a similar, um, calculated the same way, the date of last frost to the date of first frost, and we see that that's changing significantly. Um, at least in this area, it looks like we're having a, last, a first frost that happens significantly later, and as well as a last frost that's happening somewhat earlier. So there's changes on both ends. It's a little bit asymmetric and somewhat different than the, the view that you had presented, Kim, but a uh, consistent overall story, about 30-day change um, in the growing season and dependent on the, the uh, scenario that we're considering. If we look at freeze-thaw cycles, that's where things start to get a little bit interesting because the variability of climate increases, and you're, we're talking about something that happens right at a threshold, 
So if you have a warm year, you don't necessarily have to hit that threshold as much as when you have, uh, or when you have a really cold year, you won't hit that threshold as much. But when you go to these in-between years, that's when you cross this freeze-thaw threshold a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. And what we see is, and it depends a little bit on how you construct this and what assumptions you make, but with a reasonable set of assumptions, it looks like we're getting um, years in which, in, in general, there's an increasing trend in these freeze thaw cycles, and in some years, many, many more, okay? And this is a decadal average. So some years you have a huge number of freeze thaw cycles, basically one happening um, just about every other week or every other 10-day period. So this is something that, that um, is potentially really interesting. We didn't have good data, like pothole data or anything to calibrate this with going backward, but certainly has some relevant relevance in terms of how structures are designed, how often road surfaces need to be refinished, the, no, the resources that need to be allocated for maintenance of, of outdoor facilities and so forth. Okay, one aspect of agriculture that I'll address here is um, given that past data, we we're actually able to say, to make a pretty good model of how the bloom date of tart cherries changes as a function of a couple of simple variables, temperature-based variables. And shown in red is the annual time series of the bloom date. And shown in yellow is the model that we constructed. So in general, the model does a really very good job with the exception of those extreme swings there. Um, the model didn't quite capture the exact details of that, but confident enough that we could use this model to look forward a little bit and say, how would those change? How would those bloom dates change going forward? And what we see is in the most, um, in the most conservative scenarios, we have a shift of about a week to a week and a half in terms of earlier bloom dates, okay? And this is, again, a decadal average. Whereas we see something that's a shift of almost a month in the more extreme of those scenarios. And obviously that's something that the range of those scenarios is tremendous and what that means in terms of how farmers would manage those crops, the infrastructure that they need to prevent frost damage, um, or potentially shifting to different less sensitive crops um, certainly needs to be taken into account. All right, um, and then we also tried to say, well, what's the risk of loss of the crop? And this was something that was a counterintuitive result. The, r the risk appears to go down. So what we said was, all right, given that the bud burst date, what if we get a frost after that? What's the risk of that on, on a decadal average? And that actually showed that the risk goes down. Now we think that this model under predicts actual risk because there, are, um, even before bud burst, the tree does become vulnerable <coughs> if you do get another frost. But so despite the fact that the, the freeze-thaw cycling in, increased, the actual bud burst date um, was late enough in the season that the risk of crop loss, at least measured by this metric, seemed to go down somewhat. So it really does depend on the details of the question you're asking and what you're trying to assess the impacts on. Okay, so that was all simple, relatively simple modeling related to temperature effects alone. And we wanted to then say, well, what happens if we integrate changes in temperature, changes, changes in precipitation, how that would affect how the, the landscape behaves, how, how plants um, green up and senesce each season. And to do that, we needed to use a much more complex modeling tool. And we used a tool called the Landscape Hydrology Model, which we've developed um, at, in our research lab. It was actually part of my dissertation work um, over 10 years ago now. And the, the tool looks at the landscape as a series of different fluxes or flows of water, okay? Um, shown in red are flows related to evaporation or transpiration. Um, you get evaporation off the canopy or out of the soil or off of a snowpack. You get transpiration through the roots and then out the leaves. Um, and then you have downward movements of water. Water can percolate down beneath the root zone of the plants and eventually become groundwater recharge. That's a key quantity that we're interested in. And then water moves laterally with overland flow, run off into streams. And of course, this just shows the upland part of the model. It also includes wetland areas and how they behave and ice formation and evaporation and so on. There's a lot that goes into the model. I'm just gonna skip over all of it because I wanna talk about the impacts. But basically, the model takes each individual point on the landscape. In this case, we subdivided the landscape into, um, I think this one is a 250 meter cell. Okay, so every 250 meters, the model makes a prediction for that cell about all of those movements within that one cell. And then it, we look at all of the cells and how they behave together to, to get a better, a bigger regional picture. One of the best aggregators of the, the behavior of a hydrologic model is looking at stream flow, um, because that's where almost all of the water ends up um, when we're talking about surface and groundwater together. And so a single measurement in, or a gauge can capture the behavior of everything within the contributing area of that, of that stream. 
So we just took a look at three of the gauges that have longer records here, the Platte River at Honor, the Boardman River above the Brown Bridge Dam, and then the Jordan River near East Jordan. And the model performed acceptably well. We didn't calibrate the model to get it to match perfectly because what we're really more interested in, things in, in was things like, are the peak heights generally correct? And in general, how are, how are the, the uh, what we would consider the base flow levels? How are the, the groundwater levels fluctuating with, as, in response to climate? So we were pretty happy with how this model behaved and confident that it was doing a good enough job um, for the purposes of our, uh, or for our purposes. We also, in addition to those much bigger gauge systems, um, so here I'm looking at three different systems. This is the, um, this is the chain of lakes watershed shown in green. This is the Boardman River watershed shown in blue, and then a series of smaller watersheds that are all in relatively urbanized settings shown in red. And what you see is those urbanized watersheds send a lot of water into the bay, but generally only during high runoff periods. Okay? So they have much less groundwater base flow available to them, but they are still significant contributors to stream flow um, during this, the, the late winter through early spring months. Um, whereas, like the Chain of Lakes watershed and the Lower Boardman have a much steadier supply of groundwater base flow that sustain flow throughout the year. And these are uh, monthly plots, so it, it shows there's 12 dots per year on here. We can look at the model and say, all right, well, what do those fluxes, the, the movements of water look like on average when we're looking at each kind of subcomponent, okay? So, and, and we, we call that the water budget. So if you look at the various flows in the budget, how do they add up to the whole? And in this case, we're looking over the whole area, averaged over all the years that we simulated, 15 years, for each month. And what you see is, if you look in blue, evapotranspiration, it shows a curve that you would kind of expect. There's not a lot during the um, winter months, it peaks during the growing season, and then tapers off toward the winter again. Groundwater recharge, which is a key quantity in terms of water resources, peaks during the summer, or peaks during the spring, and then uh, tapers off to the, through the summer, and then picks up again in the fall, okay? Whereas runoff responds directly to snowmelt and early season rains, but in general is relatively low um, in this region because of porous soils and things like that. And if you look at it, we can look at it on an annual basis, averaged across the year, that we see that about 55% of the water goes to evaporation and transpiration, about 35% to groundwater recharge, and then runoff is the other 10%. So we can quantify these questions, things that would be very, very difficult to actually directly measure um, using this term, um, using this kind of tool. We had a question earlier about how climate change might impact recharge, um, and, that's, uh, and whether that's included in sort of regulatory frameworks for looking at water availability, and the answer is no, it's not. Um, but we can make those predictions with, with tools like this, and there are certainly other tools. This is the, just the one that we use. Um, so if we look at the change in one particular scenario, I haven't picked the most extreme, I've picked one that's considered maybe the most likely. We see that in general, you see these yellow to red colors, in general, recharge, groundwater recharge decreases out into the end of the 21st century, so out, the, out at, uh, by 2095. There are some areas of local increase, those, those are typically due to changes in how wetlands function um, further out. Um, but in general, we see a pattern of relatively, of, of slight to significant decreases in groundwater recharge. We see, on the other hand, we see significant increases of evapotranspiration, because it's a budget, right? If you get less recharge, it's because you either uh, had more runoff, or you change in precip, or you had more ET. In this case, much more of the water goes to evapotranspiration, in some places increasing by seven to eight inches a year, which is about a 30 to 40% increase in ET. So, um, but in general, the whole region expects to see about two inches more per year, which is about a 15% increase, so pretty significant. Um, and then changes in snowpack, I'm going to skip that slide for time and just look at it on a map basis. So here, if we look at what the model predicts in terms of average snowpack thickness, we see that there are pretty, pretty big changes. These are inches, not, a, not inches of snowpack thickness, but inches of water, which is, depends on the type of snowpack, but it can be between, say, 6 and 12 inches of water per inch, or inches of snow per inch of water. We see that there are areas, particularly down here in, in um, near some ski areas, and then further up where we see pretty big decreases in average annual snowpack. Um, so this, you know, but those are not uniform and they depend on how far north you are. Um, so this should be dark green up here. But so you see that in general we're seeing significant de decreases in snowpack out to the end of the century um, that'll, like we saw with our simpler models, will actually present challenges for these, um, for these ski resorts. There's also um, the changes in, in 
um, groundwater recharge and ET also have impacts on stream flow. And you can ignore the individual distinctions between the lines in this, but just get the big picture of this is, again, calendar months, January through December. On average, what we're seeing is in these small urban creeks, we're seeing significantly less flow during the late summer and significantly more flow in the, in the winter and spring. Okay? And that pattern is repeated. If we looked at larger watersheds, we'd see a very similar pattern to that. Um, but we focused on this for this project because it was of interest for stormwater management. So with stormwater management and with my last minute here, um, we're talking about, uh, in, in this case, I'm drawing again this distinction between mitigation and adaptation, talking about adaptation, oh, I'm sorry, talking about mitigation strategies. We wanted to mitigate the impacts of increased, uh, or of climate change on increased stream flow. So we looked at a couple specific scenarios. What if you reduced impervious area in urban settings? And what if you expanded the, the reach of on-site stormwater retention? Okay, so two different realistic scenarios that could be applied in a stormwater management setting, and then just simulate those directly in this, in this modeling framework. Well, both of, those, both of those methods are effective. So again, looking at this on average as a monthly change, we see that if your goal is to reduce summertime flows in those settings, you can do it very effectively with both of those methods, increasing um, increasing uh, imperviousness, decreasing imperviousness, and increasing the, the reach of on-site um, stormwater retention. They have different effects in the spring, though, relative to each other. So some slightly increased stream, spring flows, some str slightly decreased spring flows. So this seems like, okay, well, depending on what our goal was, we could potentially use this as a way of perhaps mitigating the effects of climate change. Well, unfortunately, the numbers on this axis go from 1% to 6%. But when we add that on top of climate change, where the numbers go from minus 20 to minus to plus 40 percent, what we see is this lever that we have to operate, at least when we're talking about Traverse City and its surrounding area, is really small compared to what's happening to it in terms of stormwater. Okay, so that's not to say that we can't do things to make the stormwater of better water quality, but it is to say that there's not a lot that can be done directly to actually influence that amount of stormwater runoff. It is going to change, and it's going to change because the snowpack is changing, because of temperature, because of the amount of water that comes in various seasons as, as precipitation, and of the response of the, the groundwater system. So in this case, mitigation is not an effective tool, but rather we need to be looking at adaptation. How can we adapt to these changes to achieve the outcomes or maintain, maintain or improve water quality? And then the very last thing I wanted to mention is that we do actually have a bigger tool available to us, and that's that we can change the landscape itself. If you look back at the last century, human landscape alteration has been much more powerful at influencing the water cycle than, than climate change. That is going to be overwhelmed moving forward is if, unless things are changed because climate change is gonna be so much of a stronger signal. But if we, if we recognize that, like I showed you in the plot of temperatures, we can change temperatures by several degrees just by reforesting a plot, we do actually have the ability to manipulate both temperature and water availability. So what I did was I ran a scenario where I took current land use, so with its current mixture of agriculture, urban, and forest, and so, and so forth, and then replaced it by the land use that was here pre-settlement, or at least pre-European uh, pre, uh, settlement. What we see is that you have significant changes, the color scale doesn't show it well, but significant reduction in, in groundwater recharge. And which can be very important if you're talking about managing stream flows for the, from the sake of maintaining infrastructure, you know, your, your culvert or bridge or whatever is, real, is rated to a certain capacity or you wanna affect how much sediment can move. You have the ability to actually reforest or deforest an area to achieve a change in the amount of water moving through the system and to affect the stream um, and to affect the temperature as well. So you certainly, there are tools available that are on much larger scales, um, but if you're talking about having a regional management and action plan, encouraging broad scale reforestation as a tool for counteracting increased flows um, can certainly be an option. Um, but you do need to, to use tools like this that can actually look at those flows throughout the season because average change might not be what you're interested in. You might be interested in maintaining or changing flows for a key part of the season. And this just summarizes um, what you've seen here and what I've talked about. Anthony, that was great. Thank you. Thank you.